waiting a couple of um, seconds just so everyone can join um, and then we'll start. Uh, uh, good morning and welcome uh, to this online policy dialogue uh, on EU-UK climate cooperation um, post-Brexit, uh, which has been jointly organized between the uh, European Policy Center uh, and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. I'm Fabian Zulig, the Chief Executive and Chief Economist of the EPC, uh, and I'm very glad we're having this policy dialogue uh, today, although has to be said uh, that this is a difficult moment in the EU-UK relationship. Um, but I think uh, the importance of cooperation on uh, climate uh, is um, undoubtedly uh, very high. Uh, in many ways, this is the area where we are having many shared interests, but where we are also sh um, sharing a global, a fundamental and existential question of how we address it. Um, and uh, I think here, uh, given also that we are very rapidly moving towards COP26 uh, with the hope uh, that we can make global progress, um, there is a need uh, to find ways for the EU and the UK to cooperate regardless of what is happening in the wider relationship. Um, so this uh, policy dialogue really is to try to find concrete ways, concrete recommendations on how we can do that. Um, also taking stock, of course, of where we are. Um, so in that sense, it comes at a very good moment, uh, given that COP26 is just around the corner. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. I will uh, moderate the, the panel debate and the question and answers in a minute. Um, but first, uh, we're going to have uh, just a few opening remarks um, from uh, Juliana Ita from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung London. Hello, everybody. A warm welcome also from our side. My name is Juliane and I work as project manager at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's office in London. Unfortunately, our director, Michelle Auger, is not available this morning, so I'm here to replace her. And we're very exciting to, excited to have this event today and this cooperation, fostering the British European and the British German core missions in the work of the FAS um, internationally and in London particularly. And especially now with the COP coming up and with Brexit making the relationship between the EU and the UK so much more difficult, we're very excited to have an event and to post this debate. And thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Juliana. Um, so uh, we'll start with uh, some introductory remarks um, from the panelists, um, and then we will open it up also to the audience. Um, for the audience, if you want to come into the discussion, uh, we have the Q&A uh, window where you can put any question and we will try to cover it. If you do write a question, please try to keep it short. It's very difficult to otherwise take it into account. Um, but there's also the opportunity to raise your electronic hand. Um, so uh, we will uh, come to that after the, the panel, um, but uh, we'll start with the remarks from the panel, um, and first uh, we'll go to Shane Tomlinson, Deputy Chief Executive Officer at E3G. Thank you very much, Fabian, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, I've learned when you talk about Brexit, you have to declare your loyalties up front. So um, I think it's important to say that I'm, I'm a joint Irish UK citizen. So I have an Irish father uh, and a British mother, which uh, means that Brexit really does speak to the heart of my family in a number of different ways. Um, as Fabian said, um, as we enter the finishing straight for COP26 uh, and the really urgent fight uh, to keep 1.5 degrees within reach, now is a really critical time to think about the future of EU and UK climate cooperation. 
Um, the fact that we can still talk about keeping 1.5 alive at all, however tentatively, um, owes much to the huge efforts that the EU and the UK has invested in climate over the last three decades and more. And I think you know, that is the really important starting point for this conversation, is there is a deep history of cooperation here on both sides, and that is really important. I think we should also recognise that 2021 has had a unique set of circumstances for EU-UK climate diplomacy. Obviously, the end of the transition period at the start of this year has revealed the full implications of Brexit, but this is also tied up with the impacts of COVID-19. And so it is sometimes difficult to unpick one, one actor from the other in terms of how we navigate this new normal. I think it's also been clear, it's, it's been coming for a while, but really this year, that climate is now a top tier geopolitical issue. It now sits alongside trade and security as something that is regularly dealt with at heads of state level and not just delegated to ministers of environment and energy. It will always be on the agenda at the G7, at the G20, at all of the major meetings that matter. This has massive advantages. Tackling climate change obviously requires whole of economy and whole of society change, but it can be a double-edged sword and climate can now be traded off against other issues. And I'm sure you know, many people on this call will have, will have been there where you know, countries are out there saying, well, you know, if you just go soft as well as on climate, you can have this trade deal. Or you know, if you just change your stance on human rights, maybe we can do more on, on clean technology. And so we do have to navigate these, these trade-offs as well as being able to think about this. However, the biggest obvious set of unique circumstances this year is the UK and Italy, both as the co-presidents of COP26 and at the same time chairing the G7 and the G20. And this has provided a core driving force for both sides to work together. There is nothing like the political success or failure of a major summit to focus minds where it really matters. And so while this last year hasn't been perfect in terms of EU-UK climate cooperation, I think there has been a lot of productive things that we can point to, and that is a really important basis. Which is a very good thing, because obviously if we look at the broader politics of post-Brexit cooperation, that can take us to some very difficult places indeed. Obviously, you know, in the last 48 hours, we've seen a lot over the future of the Northern Ireland Protocol and what's happening there. You know, but many other things, the UK participation in the Australia, UK, US uh, security initiative, AUKUS, earlier this year was obviously a major issue, uh, particularly for France, but for many other EU member states. Um, you know, the so-called vaccine wars we had earlier this year, um, ongoing supply chain difficulties in the UK, um, you know, growing discussions, you know, uh, with France, you know, threatening potentially, um, you know, suspending energy interconnection in relation to fishing rights, um, the going, growing gas crisis and what's happening to gas prices. There is a tremendous amount of tension in the, in the post-Brexit relationship, and we have to recognise this. I don't think anybody expected that Brexit would be a smooth diplomatic process. There were always going to be rough edges as the UK sought its new place in the world, and the EU obviously sought to maintain the integrity of its place and its key systems, especially the single market. So I think this brings me to the central question for the discussion today. Will climate cooperation that we've seen the positive things around COP26 this year be swamped by broader negative politics after COP when we don't have that same urgent presidency? Or can it be sustained and perhaps even be used to create better cooperation within the broader politics itself? I'm an optimist. I'm going to put my cards on the table there. So for me, there is a path to sustained enhanced cooperation, particularly on uh, climate change. But this is not an easy path. And I think we have to recognise the real risks that are out there and it's necessary to navigate them if we're not to be stopped. However, I think the obvious starting point is what will be necessary uh, coming out of COP26 as the expected actions. As I say, the EU and UK, I think, has worked really well uh, you know, on things like increasing global NDC ambition and engaging with other countries. They've coordinated well on meeting the, the pledge for 100 billion in, in climate finance for developing countries. You know, this is despite the backdrop of the UK uh, overseas development aid cuts. Um, they've established shared priorities in other areas, particularly around fossil fuel and coal phase out out, private climate finance, youth engagement, adaptation, risk and resilience. On all of these issues, I think this year we can point to examples of the EU and the UK working well together, um, and that, that has enhanced the chances of success at COP26. And COP26 is likely to be as much a start as an end of a process. 
you know, the key things that are obviously on the table is to further enhance ambition in the 2020s to explicitly make 1.5 degrees uh, C the, the, the goal within, within uh, the Paris Agreement, um, you know, and to, to follow through on uh, making coal history. Those are going to be some of the top headline messages that we expect to see coming out of the COP26 in, in, in November. But all of that is going to require accelerated action into 2022 in order to deliver. And so processes such as the Powering Past Coal Alliance, you know, which obviously the UK was central in forging, but which has you know, strong support from EU member states and the European Union, the Energy Transitions Council this year, which has made momentum, again, both of those being really significant in making coal history. All of these processes have the ability to continue into 2022 and provide important forums for further diplomatic cooperation. I think obviously with next year's COP being held in Africa, adaptation is always going to be front and center as well. And you know, this is a difficult issue in the negotiations, but something where I think, again, the UK and the EU can work very productively together. So I think there is a lot that we could say, actually, the momentum can carry us through into 2022. Some of that positive cooperation can exist. However, I think when we look at you know, what's necessary to sustain this over a three to five year period, I don't think what's happening in the international negotiations alone is enough to continue that. I think it will be swamped by the broader politics if we don't make important changes. And so this takes us back to a number of other areas, particularly those things that have been highlighted in the, in the trade cooperation agreement that we're taking forward at the moment, uh, where I think it's really important that we make progress. So obviously on energy interconnection, you know, and the potentially massive savings there are to both sides from having an integrated grid uh, and the ease with which that will enable us to maximize our renewable uh, potentials, the options to link, potentially link carbon pricing, what it means for trade and green technologies going forward, the debate around uh, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, these are going to be really key. And then also things that aren't necessarily so linked to, to the TCA. So obviously managing energy security risks through decarbonisation and particularly uh, our shared approach to Russia and the Middle East, uh, given where gas and oil prices are at the moment. Um, you know, private finance and particularly you know, thinking about things like green taxonomies, green bonds, all of these things are really important and I think provide a really substantive agenda. And if we can make progress on those issues, then I think this will put us in a much better place. Obviously, all of these things have win-wins. So it is easy from a policy perspective to say both sides will be better off. And you know, we do have to come back to that. That is true. The citizens in both areas will be better off if we cooperate on all these issues. But it also runs into the hard politics. And this is where I think we need to make some real changes. You know, the UK has made a big effort in a pivot to Asia um, and a pivot towards the US, although the chances of a US trade deal um, mean that's going to be very difficult. I am deeply skeptical that this will actually provide the UK with the security and the prosperity that it wants. Uh, and certainly from my own work, you know, whenever you travel to Asia and you look at the opportunities, uh, particularly in terms of decarbonisation, what you also find there are a whole lot of European businesses who are also investing. So I don't think the UK can go to the other side of the world and escape its relationship with, with Europe's. I think it's really important that it comes back to that. I think it's also key in the UK that we recognise the potential for a race to the bottom on standards. We still don't have an environment building legislation. This is a huge embarrassment. And I think there are questions over the strength and independence of the new Office for Environmental Protection. And so it's really important that the UK does strengthen these measures to give a clear commitment to Europe that it is going to be maintain a high standards UK going forward. But I think there's also changes that are necessary on the EU side to do this. The EU policy of strategic autonomy, it makes sense from an internal EU perspective. I completely appreciate that. You know, there is a real risk that, that uh, Donald Trump or a similar you know, right-wing skeptic would be elected in the US in 2024. The EU does need an independent place, an independent voice in the world. However, the offer to third countries as part of this strategic autonomy push can look very, very hard. You know, it's easy to back the UK into the corner on the number of these things, and the consequences will be similar to AUKUS. If the UK can't see genuine security and prosperity in cooperating with the EU, it will seek these other arrangements. And even though I don't think they will ultimately work, they can also be deeply damaging to Europe while they do this. And so I think we do need to think about you know, how we can make progress, where the areas of compromise are. Is this going to require a fundamental compromise by the EU on the single market? No, I don't think it does to do this. Does it require a change in approach and things like the North Sea's grid cooperation? Yes, I think we could do a lot more there. And I don't think that that's going to undermine fundamentally where the EU is. So as we navigate this path through the issues, if we actually start from trade and security priorities and try to work back to climate, 
I think we're doomed for failure. I think those other issues will stop us. But if we start from climate, then I am much more positive. We need to get beyond the zero sum politics that, that is dominant at the moment. And climate is the obvious issue where you have to move beyond zero sum politics in order to make progress. The trade and cooperation agreement pioneered putting climate at the start of as an essential element of a trade deal, the first time it's ever happened in the world. I think this is a very good starting point to come back to. So if we reframe EU-UK cooperation around reorienting um, our, our progress towards low carbon economies, building shared security and how particularly energy security um, and raising international ambition, then I think there is much that can be said for EU-UK climate co cooperation going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and going straight uh, to the next speaker, Andreas Dimmelmeier, Policy Analyst on Climate and Environment at the Foundation for European Progressive Studies. Yes, uh, hello. Thanks uh, very much for, for having me. Um, so also for my full disclosure um, declarations on, on Brexit related issues, I'm German living in Brussels. My kind of a personal connection was that I lived two years in Coventry uh, during my PhD. Um, and I'm not a Brexit expert. I'm much more on the kind of sustainability and sustainable finance, uh, which is my background. And so what I'm going to rather than go into the diplomatic uh, relations, I'm, I like to raise three points and illustrate them uh, kind of through the case study of sustainable finance. And the first one is what it was already said by, by both uh, the previous two speakers or by you also, Fabian, as the uh, kind of moderator is, we in climate policy, we have an existentialist and a cross-cutting one. So, I think what is very important just as a, as a general principle in, in all things that relate to this is to keep track or keep in sight that the main priority here must be really that there is an impact on the climate uh, mitigation adaptation and also that we ensure a just transition. If climate issues become kind of a negotiating mass for supposedly other important things, then we're not moving in the right direction. Uh, I think this is something, this is an abstract principle, but I would like to say that we have to keep this in mind because at the stage where we are with the timeline that we have to really do systemic transformation, we, we cannot integrate this into politics, uh, into the kind of day-to-day -day politics as something that we might trade against something else. The second thing that I want to raise, which I think you also mentioned in the um, kind of in the introductory brief, is that we have here, interestingly, a um, kind of the, the two levels of the political level, where we see a lot of declarations, where we see a lot of escalations, and the technical level, so to speak, where we actually, especially in the realm of sustainable finance, have seen a lot of cooperation. Now, this also opens an interesting dynamic, if you want. So we see declarations of kind of, okay, this is our big plans, we are a climate leader, et cetera, et cetera. We see also the measures then that are announced, kind of Fit for 55, Green New Deal, and then they go to the technical level. And often the measures are presented kind of as a policy success from the UA, the, the EU, the UK, et cetera, all, all the countries. And then on technical level, it's less on the the implementation, so to speak, has a more, has a different dynamic because there it's not a kind of, we are proud of this or we, we don't do this because we, we, we come from a policy perspective, but we want to implement this. And then you have different people working on this. And here I'm gonna tell you a little bit on the, the sustainable finance issue, how they're actually, even though uh, on the big policy level, there might be differences that also could spill over to climate, related issues on the technical level, actually you have this cooperation, for example, both the, uh, the UK and the EU are members of the Network for Green Financial System or the central banks and regulators are, and there we have joint scenario development. They are in the international platform on sustainable finance, which was launched by the EU, the kind of standard development. And those things are different dynamics and it's good that there is a lot of work together. And actually what we see there or what I would like to see there is actually a race to the top. We need methodologies here to say, okay, what are climate related risks, both from physical climate change happening 
or from say stranded assets if we have a huge carbon price and then certain firms can no longer operate and then this uh, profitably and then this filters through through the financial system so there we actually have a lot of technical cooperation that goes on regardless of say the day-to-day -day political differences however the, then the interesting thing comes there's a dynamic between the two so for example if we now say both the EU and the UK want to be leaders on green finance, then the question is, okay, how, how do you become a leader on green finance? Do you do it by working together with others, by kind of cross-fertilizing you to do the race to the top? Or do you do it by, I want to attract all of the greenwashing people uh, to my financial hub and give you relatively lax standards? And I think this is the kind of political decision where I guess from the technical working groups, there's very much an appetite. Also, if you look at what the central banks are doing and the regulators or the EBA is doing here to prevent the greenwashing and what the commission is doing. But then there is a political element to this. And I think you've seen this in the, in the EU with the discussions on the EU taxonomy, where you had in the council a lot of kind of po more political discussion, which challenged some of the science-based recommendations from the technical expert group because they wanted uh, certain national priorities reflected. And this is an interesting dynamic, I think, and where you need the, the trust and the message from the political level to support the technical level, but also the technical level not to be in the driving seat because otherwise uh, you, you basically lose the legitimacy and the possibility for participation. And I'm not saying that I have an answer here, but I'm saying the two things going back to my first part of the intervention that matter here is really that we have a discernible impact in really addressing the climate crisis and that we ensure that this is a just transition. Also reflecting here, of course, that uh, there will be a cost, but the cost will be has to be distributed in a fair and equitable way. And we can't uh, basically not go in a sense and say okay look we had already some losers regionally concentrated from globalization now we will we'll have the transformation to a decarbonized society it's again the same people that will have to pay the bill this is not gonna fly in a sense and this is something we need to uh, also very much uh, have as the kind of goalpost when designing the policies now yes i think Anyway, it's more opening some questions, but I've seen, if, if you want to have my assessment, we already have a lot of multilateral institutions uh, also uh, where civil society and the private sector do participate in related to, say, uh, green and sustainable finance. So I'm not, I think there is already a lot of cooperation going on technical level, and it's going on in a very productive way, and it's going somewhere where we actually can have a race to the top. But it needs the political backing and it needs kind of an assurance and trust from the political level that they can do their work, that this it will be kind of challenged also if in case that there is something missing from the agenda from the political side, but also an assurance that, okay, no, that people really do respect the work of these bodies and are not going to go for short term gains in terms of attracting some business through allowing greenwashing. But, and there's a lot of, in this agenda, there's a lot of stuff to do. I mean, the commission published the, uh, renew, um, the renewed sustainable finance strategy. Also, there's a lot of go going on uh, in the UK with development of taxonomies with the climate stress tests. So there is, I think, a really working agenda and it's, it's going well, but it needs to be ensured that it actually now also delivers as we now see actually uh, as the financial sector adopts green finance, we see more and more greenwashing, and we see that the space really has to, uh, to be uh, supervised more tightly if we really want to deliver on impact. Okay, so I'm not sure if that was perhaps uh, the intervention that you were looking for, but I think that from my perspective, this is what I can see as interesting topics to move forward here, the cooperation on the technical level, but always with the backing of a political narrative that really emphasizes climate action and just transition. Thank you very much. I, I think that fits very well in, in setting the, the oval scene. Um, and maybe we'll hear a bit more about what 
technical cooperation is already taking place. Um, so we'll turn uh, to Claire McFarlane, who is Councillor of People, Partnership and Sustainability in the UK mission to the EU. Thanks very much for the introduction and, and for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm delighted to speak to the audience on the important and very timely issue, as we've said, of the EU-UK climate cooperation. Um, I should say that some of what I'm going to say is possibly duplicating what you've already heard, so apologies for that, I and mean, I'll, try, I'll try and skip it where, where I can. Um, so in some ways, the question this event is looking to address is, is partly answered. We've always so we've already had two years since we left the EU and 10 months operating since the end of the implementation period. So our relationship post-Brexit is sort of well and truly in operation, and albeit are still finding our feet. Um, and we've been genuinely pleased to see the constructive and open engagement we've had with the EU institutions on climate policy, and in particular ahead of COP26 summit. Um, at the end of the month, as, as you've all heard. And whilst the engagement may not always be publicly visible, um, I should say that we've had really extensive engagement across the EU institutions, as well as the member states, of course, Italy, for the reasons that Shane set out. Um, and it's the thing I suppose most, worth, most, most worth be highlighting is the excellent relationship between the COP president designate, Alex Sharma in the UK, and executive vice president, Franz Timmermans in the EU, where they've genuinely had very regular and fruitful conversations. Obviously, those interactions are not the same as if we were still an EU member state. We're not cooperating and engaging on 100% of all climate EU business, but we have been able to demonstrate active engagement on areas of mutual interest, as well as areas where we can actually have some healthy competition between us. And so far, that's worked quite well. And going forward, I think the identification of such areas are going to be really sort of key to a successful relationship. On the mutual interest side, an example of that would be the engagement we've had with the Commission on, on pushing other countries to raise their ambition. We've had exchanges at all levels, including ministerial, on how to push for more ambitious, nationally determined contributions from others. And we've been able to have a genuinely open conversation about which of us has the best diplomatic links with certain countries to be able to use that as leverage. On the healthy competition side, um, we've really seen huge strides forward by the EU in recent months on climate ambition, and we're glad to see it. So they, as you all know, submitted an ambitious nationally determined contribution enshrined in the European climate law, and that law takes inspiration from some of the domestic UK legislation. And of course, in July, we saw the Commission's Fit for 55 package, an enormous undertaking for the EU, and we very much welcome the package as it outlines the EU plans to deliver its medium-term targets, and we hope others will, will follow their example. So that's sort of backward looking. In a few weeks time, of course, we have the summit, um, and the UK's sort of policy focus for that is around ambition, the NDCs I mentioned, the long-term strategies to deliver those, as well as sectoral objectives around coal, cash, and pardon, cash, coal, cars, and trees. Um, and that's alongside making sure that 1.5 temperature goal really does sort of remain alive and the right achievable objective. I won't go into sort of the detail of the objectives of the summit, but of course happy to take questions later. Um, and it's going to be kicked off by a two day world leader summit right at the beginning to set clear political direction and ambition, sort of setting the tone and sort of giving the, the more detailed experts sort of the direction for the rest of the summit and sort of setting that political direction. Um, we've particularly seen in recent weeks the sort of EU um, upping their ambition, for example, on the climate finance target. They're already the biggest donor to the 100 billion climate finance target. And, and the President von der Leyen announced at her State of the Union address a further 4 billion towards that. That was very welcome, but also a very important factor in persuading others, including the United States, to increase its contribution. So you can see the knock on impact it had. Um, and then, of course, there are more sectoral announcements, uh, phasing out of internal combustion engines, uh, phasing out coal, both of which very closely align with our COP objectives. So you can see for the EU very much as a climate leader right now. 
So in terms of how our sort of the UK government is is prioritizing our engagement with the EU, therefore, in the run up and during the summit, is very much to work with our European partners to secure commitments from other major emitters and looking to maximize to best effect our respective international diplomatic networks to sort of deliver ambition further abroad. So hopefully at, COPS, at the summit itself, you should very much see the UK and EU singing from the same hymn sheet, pushing in the same direction on overall ambition and the need to deliver progress. So what does this mean for the relationship going forward beyond the summit? Well, I think firstly thinking about the fact that we will still be president. So the summit is the start of our presidency. It is not the end. Um, but we will, of course, need to sort of more strategically identify the areas of shared interest and how we work together on them. And there will naturally be a reduction in the volume of engagement when you don't have the summit driving momentum. So we both need to work to retain the excellent relationships. And I believe the willpower is on both sides. So throughout the presidency year, we want to continue to press the UNFCCC parties in particular on the implementation of the commitments made at the summit or pre-summit. For the EU, we're already seeing implementation play out in front of us through the Fit for 55 package. And our focus therefore needs to be building on the EU's and UK's work on joint diplomacy to hold others' feet to the fire on implementation. It's probably also worth noting that it'll be quite important for making sort of the most use of the EU as a, as a trendsetter, a regulatory setter. Um, so I've lost my place, hang on, bear with me. <laughs> so um, they're a producer and consumer, they're able to influence global standards. One of the examples might be on zero emission vehicles. So that's something that we should keep exploring with them going forward. And of course, we can also use our presidency to shape the priorities and actions going into the next COP, COP27, to be hosted by Egypt. And from that COP onwards, we should see the EU and UK almost as having an outside role. It wasn't long ago the UK was part of Team EU in the negotiations. Now we will have two voices and hopefully pushing in the same direction. So the presidency in COP is not the only route. We can assure ourselves that the important UK-EU relationship on climate can be maintained. As has been mentioned, there's a special status of certain parts of the UK-EU trade and cooperation agreement for ongoing cooperation including on carbon pricing and North Sea energy cooperation. And that will be an important aspect for guaranteed cooperation. But there is more to UK EU climate cooperation than that that is referenced in the TCA. I'm not going to try and cover all of it, but a few things I would mention would be the fact that European counterparts are active and hosting much of the regular calendar of the international climate events, annual Petersburg Dialogue, the Ministerial on Climate Action, and we all need to think post-presidency about how we dot back into those and build on them together. And also under our G7 presidency, we achieved the first ever net zero G7. So during our COP presidency, we will hand the G7 over to Germany for 2022 and further sort of the climate and environmental goals as part of that. And that's going to be a really key moment in the next year. And finally, I'd note that the UK hopes to associate with Horizon soon and that will help collaboration on the vital research necessary to find joint solutions to tackling climate change. So while I've looked to draw out a range of reasons that collaboration has been excellent to date, and there are specific reasons we will look to maintain those relationships going forward, I'm not blind to the fact that there are, of course, risks and challenges. The wider political relationship will, of course, be key, but I hope the sort of the, the global, the cross-border, challenges that climate change poses us will help us mitigate through that. And without the summit to focus minds, there is absolutely a risk of slippage in relationships over time. That tends to raise questions over whether certain more bureaucratic structures are required for regular engagement, and there'll be a range of views about that and pros and cons of, of, of both. But while the EU relationship will continue to be important, we of course need to avoid seeing the UK's future on climate purely through the lens of an EU-UK relationship. I need to make sure that new structures don't inadvertently risk limiting UK ambition or its agility to respond to an evolving challenge. And furthermore, there'll be areas that the UK and the EU won't necessarily always be in alignment. We'll have to ensure we can engage constructively in those. As Lord Frost said last night, we have comparable climate goals with net zero in mind, but there's a discussion coming on the EU's plans, for example, on carbon border adjustment mechanism. 
And let me finish by saying that the UK-EU climate cooperation post-Brexit is something we're still actively considering. So the events such as this are a really useful means to develop our thinking and actions going forward. And I really look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion with, with this in mind. So thanks, thanks again for having me. Thanks very much. Um, and last but not least in this first round, uh, we have Kira Winkel, Head of Center for Climate and Foreign Policy at uh, DGAP. Thank you very much. Um, happy to join this discussion today. Yes, today uh, we are a few weeks away from the COP, um, and I think somebody said there were a high input uh, of efforts, um, with which I agree, but uh, I would add to that that we have very low, low output in terms of actual emissions reductions. So we are at a crucial moment in time yet again, because we have not solved the climate issue. Um, so this, this means naturally that we have to collaborate on climate. The EU-UK partnership um, is an important one um, to, to foster ambition. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that the Brexit and its aftermath have made this a lot more difficult. So I think some honest words are also uh, appropriate here. Um, I don't think that climate diplomacy happens in a sort of political vacuum. Actually, on the contrary, I am observing uh, at the last COPs that climate efforts are increasingly linked to other fields in, in politics. So I, I would disagree on the notion that uh, we can move uh, ahead on climate regardless. I wish this were true, but I don't think that this, uh, it is really realistic. Um, there are some things um, we, we can do and we have to solve. A lot has been said already, but I will just um, add a few uh, concise points, which I think are uh, not explored sufficiently yet. So um, if we look at the energy partnership, we see that there's a mutual interest, a strong mutual interest uh, between the EU and the UK. Um, both uh, need, need to make investments, high investments to make uh, transformation towards sustainability possible. Uh, for the EU um, to realize the Green Deal, it needs to enter kind of strategic dependencies, right? So, um, and entering a dependency on the energy market with the UK uh, lessens the dependency on other actors such as China and Russia. And this is obviously strongly preferred. Um, however, there is a, a, a major challenge um, because the energy partnership is agreed in the, in the TCA only until 2026. So long-term investments, which are necessary, these are very large scale investments uh, to make this shift are difficult uh, to make because of this lacking investment security. And um, more than that, um, I mean, it has been kind of referred to in, indirectly, but to, just to uh, restate this very clearly, the, the TCA agreement is currently on kind of shaky grounds because um, of the Northern Ireland protocol is not adhered to, right? So the, the preconditions for the formulation of the TCA agreement um, under which energy cooperation falls are the exit agreement and are, is the Northern Ireland protocol. So I think this contractual loyalty is of the essence to move uh, for future cooperation agreements in any field. And this includes also uh, bilateral agreements between different EU member states and the UK, um, which, which are needed and wanted, right? So I think um, it, it has an effect and uh, these fields are not completely uh, isolated. So I think it's important to mention this for our, our mutual understanding of the problem. Um, I think where there is a huge potential and need for partnership is on innovation, on research and development. Um, um, I'm, I'm talking in the, in the climate field um, about smart grids, um, AI, um, the Internet of Things, all these kind of areas. Um, I think we have um, uh, both a mutual interest um, and a strong interconnection in the science field. So, I mean, just speaking from climate science, um, the partnerships between European universities and UK universities are of the essence uh, for, um, for our scientific progress. And um, the UK has been a very strong partner in a variety um, of research programs on, on climate issues. And um, of course, everybody wants this, this to continue. Um, talking again about, about Glasgow, it's since this next uh, event in our calendar, 
Um, I think the EU has uh, been um, very much welcoming the UK continuous ambitions in the climate area. So I think this is extremely positive that there was no rollback or anything like this happening. So I think that uh, the UK is also ramping up um, their emissions reduction targets, etc. Uh, is important. Um, at the same time, I think what would be most useful for European countries is to better understand the concrete implementation of emissions reduction targets of the UK. So I think here, if we talk about what is going to happen in the next one, two, three, five years, instead of what is going to happen in, in a time horizon of 20 to 30 years, um, I think if we have a stronger exchange on these um, maybe more difficult questions, um, I think this would help um, um, all countries involved, basically, because it is a very, very difficult um, thing to agree on climate mitigation targets uh, in the next uh, one to five years. But this is a crucial moment in time. Um, some tipping elements may already be reached um, in five years time. So I think it's very, very important that um, we yeah, continue to, to reduce emissions, um, but really ramp up the speed um, of innovation and of um, emissions reductions. Yeah, so I think mutual learning is, is the key uh, word here. Um, and I think it was a very um, positive development um, that uh, the, in the Glasgow COP, um, the UK will try to um, ramp up ambition around certain themes. So through these uh, theme days, that um, are happening in parallel to the regular UNFCCC negotiations to foster kind of partnerships that can happen in smaller groups than the uh, entire UNFCCC. So it's, it's obviously very important that the UNFCCC um, negotiations continue with all members, but I think it's also important that certain countries um, spearhead certain developments, such as the electrification of the transport sector. Maybe one example of this um, is the methane partnership. And I think to methane, we have not paid sufficiently attention. Uh, methane is an extremely potent um, greenhouse gas. It's not as long lived as CO2, but it's much more, um, it's, it's uh, traps much more heat in, in, in our earth system. So it's extremely important that um, methane is reduced. And um, this was initiated by the Biden presidency and both uh, EU and UK have, um, have become signatories to this pledge. And I think together they can bring in more partners uh, into this round. Um, yeah, I think some, uh, some questions will remain. For example, will the UK link its uh, emissions trading system to the EU emissions trading system? Um, and in what way, um, or will it remain separate? And then if it remains entirely separate, um, then what will happen uh, with the CBAM? Um, I think it would still be possible to uh, integrate uh, the EU in uh, the UK into the, uh, into the CBAM. Um, and um, maybe one last remark, I think beyond um, sort of, uh, diplomacy of EU, UK on a national uh, level, on the EU, EU Commission's level, um, I think we can also look for kind of new um, uh, ways to move forward between, for example, city partnerships for sustainability that look at how are European cities de dealing with um, changes in um, um, changes in the climate, so how are they adjusting, how are they adapting to um, climate impacts, but also what progress are they making in terms of, for example, um, making, um, electrifying the transport system, um, changing um, the electric, um, electricity sector to um, green um, forms of electricity, renewable energy, um, and also the question of um, how do we build our future cities, right? So. Um, are we continuing to use very intense CO2 intensive concrete and steel uh, um, yeah, mode of architecture, or will we eventually use uh, wood and other, um, and other materials, maybe new materials that are able to, uh, to kind of trap CO2 uh, and become sort of uh, carbon sinks uh, in, inside of cities. Um, I will I will leave it at that, um, but I'm very happy to discuss and and learn from you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to the, all the panelists. Um, very good inputs um, for the discussion. Um, please also indicate to me if you want to come in and um, react to anything you heard from the other panelists. 
Um, but just in, in terms of uh, the um, putting the cards on the table in terms of Brexit, um, I just want to add that um, uh, I uh, am a German citizen, but I have very close links to the UK uh, and particularly Scotland. Um, so uh, I've been working on Brexit for quite a while, and that might also mean that in terms of moderation, I might be a little bit more active on uh, some of the Brexit questions than a moderator usually would be. Um, uh, one thing which, which comes to my mind when I listen to this debate, and that's um, from my background as a political economist, um, just because something makes common sense doesn't mean it will happen. And I think this is something which strikes me within this debate, um, that of course uh, we can find a lot of reasons why it makes imminent sense uh, for the UK and the EU to cooperate on this topic. Um, but I'm not so convinced that what we are seeing at the moment is actually working. Uh, and what I mean by that is not the technical level. I think there's a lot happening at the technical level uh, where also the cooperation between officials is, is very good. Um, but what I recall also is Paris, when we see the role the French government took in terms of leadership, in terms of bringing people together. Um, it is necessary in these kind of moments uh, in global negotiation to have that kind of leadership. But I find it difficult to see how that can work uh, at the current moment between the EU and the UK. Um, so um, maybe I'm a little bit more skeptical also because I work on Brexit um, and, and that is coloring um, my uh, opinions on this. Um, but I, I wanted to sort of drill down a bit more on uh, COP26 um, and what we expect um, to happen. It is very imminent. Uh, we're talking about a matter of weeks. Um, what, what are the panelists' expectations of what we can achieve um, at COP26, also in uh, cooperation between the EU and the UK? Um, does anyone want to, to come in? Uh, I can come in to begin with, if that helps. Yes, otherwise I'll pick on someone. So I was going to pick <laughs> on Claire. Um, so, Claire, please. Uh, so um, I suppose I'll, I'll be the more ambitious end of this. So um, for the for the summit itself, you know, I think the, the key priority really for us is the at the at the first instance is the World Leaders Summit, and there are four sessions to that. There's there's the plenary, which will have sort of all all leaders present, and we're currently expecting over 140 leaders to be there. There's then three sessions. One is on ambition, where we're expecting further commitments to be made and a discussion as well. Most importantly, actually, about sort of where that all leaves us in terms of overall ambition globally. The second is around innovation. Picking up on some of the comments I earlier made, that is where I think we really need concrete proposals and commitments made through a leader's statement but also through member states and other international, sort of the EU, but other countries signing up to what will be called Glasgow breakthroughs on the innovation side. That, that is looking to draw out sort of how you work together on innovation, how, which areas of your economy you might be sort of particularly targeting to drive forward innov innovation, because quite clearly no one's gonna be hitting their climate targets without significant innovation in the climate space in the coming years. And the third area I should mention is around forests and biodiversity, where again, looking for an ambitious leader statement about how we are going to slight, not only try and stop the degradation that we are seeing in forests internationally, but also start rolling that back. And I think the key thing there and throughout the whole of the COP summit is making sure that this is genuinely a global conversation, not just those sort of on the forest side, looking as if we're blaming those countries with whether it's tropical rainforests, whether it's um, more temperate climate forests, but actually it's also on the, the consumers of the goods that are from that. So help, hoping to make that a genuine conversation across the sort of key players. And I think if we can come out of the summit with a view that 
not only have we talked about ambition, but we've got more into implementation and what that might look like in future, I think that will be a successful summit. I should say, I don't think this is, we shouldn't let's say compare it to Paris. We're not trying to do a fully new treaty um, in this space, but of course, trying to finalize the Paris Agreement in certain aspects. But I think keeping 1.5 alive is also, if people can generally believe it's still on the table by the end of the summit, I think that would be a good outcome from where we are, but others will want to add. Thanks, uh, Shane, you wanted to come in. Thank you, yes, I mean, Close to a, a, a lot of these, I think the, the piece I would add is, is obviously, you know, we need a real focus on the ambition mechanism within the Paris Agreement. So, you know, this idea that we come back, countries come back every five years and increase their NDCs. And we know that, you know, we have to drive action before, you know, in advance of 2030. And so for me, that's the, you know, one of the big ticket things to look in in the text is, can we strengthen the text around the ambition mechanism in order to make sure that actually we are gonna come back and look at NDC ambition again before 2030 and drive action in the 2020s. And I think, you know, that feels like that is that is potentially doable, um, but I think it does require a lot of cooperation, particularly between the UK and the EU, uh, in order to in order to achieve that. Um, I think in terms of sort of the politics and, and where the EU and the UK are really important in delivering a lot of the things that, that Claire was saying, is also about how we engage with other countries and particularly the high ambition coalition. So the the network that that spans north and south countries um, and that is you know globally committed to to, to keeping one point five alive. And I think that is only going to work, you know, and there are always many, many tensions inside the high ambition coalition because of the, the different things, you know, in Paris, it, hang, it held together for about 48 hours. Um, but that was enough to get the deal over the line. And so if the UK and the EU isn't prepared to work together to do that, then I think that's, you know, that we're, we're not going to get the success that we need. And so how they coordinate together in engaging those third countries, I think is, is, is really critical um, and ensuring that this is this is perceived as being an inclusive and, and fair process. Um, I think obviously the Paris rulebook is, is also going to be key in the negotiations. So particularly Article 6 and market mechanisms is going to be real, one of the most contentious areas that we'll, we'll be looking at there. And I think it comes back to speaking to keeping the integrity of the agreement alive. So there are a lot of bad compromises we can make in Paris that essentially allow for lots of dodgy carbon credits, be they related to forest and agriculture or other places, to come into the agreement and really destroy ambition. And I think it's the EU and the UK have to be the, the, the grouping that actually holds uh, integrity together. And that's going to be really critical in order to make process in that. And obviously, there are some quite significant tensions within the EU when it comes to things like forest credit issues. So that's no easy challenge in order, in order to do that. And then finally, I think would be the politics around loss and damage, uh, as I say, you know, going into uh, Egypt and Africa COP next year, loss and damage is one of the areas that I think could significantly undermine the negotiations. It's very easy for that just to be stuck in transactional politics of how much money a rich country is going to give to poor countries. Obviously, that's a really, really critical part of it, but it's it's a broader conversation than that. And I think you know, the EU and the UK particularly need to work with the US to drag the US into a better space on loss and damage if we're going to get the successful outcomes that we need. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any of the other panelists wanting to come in, but please indicate uh, uh, Kia. Yeah, maybe just to, to add on to this. I mean, yes, um, I, uh, I agree that uh, EU, UK need to bring in other countries, but I think it's it may be even more important to be accountable to our own goals, right? So if I look at Germany, Germany will, um, after it has hit the target for 2020, will now uh, not hit the target in retrospect, so to say, um, because it only achieved the target because of COVID-19 uh, infections, uh, yeah, prohibitions basically that uh, slowed down the economy. So um, I think our accountability is, is key. So I think what, um, if, if I talk to leaders from the small island countries or from Bangladesh, um, what they want to see is of course, a fulfillment of the 100 billion uh, uh, agreement, but also um, they want to see sincere emissions reductions. So, and this goes also for countries with tropical forests, I mean, um, I think it's it's almost shameful that we are not able to exit our from our um, uh, coal fire power plant production 
um, but are asking other countries with much larger coal sectors and much higher poverty rates to exit from theirs. Um, so I think it's, a, it's not an ideal negotiating position. So I think um, accountability is key. And here I want to also emphasize um, uh, the G7 again, uh, um, as, as we have the G7 handover during the COP. Um, I mean, the G7 has promised, for example, to abolish fossil fuel subsidies. Has this happened? No, it has not happened. So, I mean, the question is, we have, we're having these forums where we make relatively good progress on setting ambitious targets, but the implementation um, lags severely behind. So the question is, we, will we uh, remain uh, to be seen as like reliable partners? I don't think so, if we continue as such. So I think what is important is that we show that we are accountable um, for the targets that we set ourselves. Um, even if it incurs economic costs, because we saw uh, all around the world, we saw the wildfires, we saw extreme heat events, uh, we saw uh, deaths because of the events, we saw deaths because of flooding events in Germany, um, the, the economic costs and the social costs that are connected to these events are much higher than the, than the costs for transition. Andreas. Yeah, I mean, uh, just also two small additions. I very much agree uh, with what uh, both uh, Kira and, and Shane said. I mean, on the uh, basically on the credibility and the one thing that I would like to add here, which also links a little bit to Article 6, I think, with the whole discussions about offsets and additionality and so on, is that the, cred the credibility of a commitment of reductions also depends on that you really don't have too generous assumption about negative emissions, because, I mean, there's a lot of First, there's a lot of equity issues. Okay, where uh, like uh, where is all those forests planted? Biodiversity impacts, uh, land grabbing, all those kind of things. And then also, if you to use like um, direct air removal, uh, there there's still a lot of technical and cost issues. So really, this is the kind of uh, the extreme solution for the residual stuff. This should be made clear in in in, in what you you promise. And but but basically, that you can be really credible and that you don't. Uh, make assumptions about something that is unlikely to happen as your kind of central scenario for for ambition. Can I just come in on this very briefly again, because I, I, I entirely agree um, that uh, the the negative emissions assumptions uh, also underlying some of the scenarios um, that we're looking at uh, are uh, yeah they're extremely uncertain, right? Also where the finances for these negative emissions should come from is, is completely unclear to me at this point. So we have to focus um, our efforts on emissions reductions. And just to, to add on this, because I think it's, um, it's of course uh, easy to, to point fingers um, at some of the countries that are blocking um, uh, the, what the majority wants in terms of uh, Article 6. Um, for example, uh, Brazil, but at the same time, we also have to acknowledge that the products that are kind of destroying the rainforest, there are consumed among other uh, places here in Europe and the UK, right? So um, the question is, um, uh, what, uh, what complicity uh, do we have in the destruction of tropical rainforests um, in, a, in a globalized economy? So I think this is also key um, to look at if we want to change um, and if we want to improve the protection of tropical forests. It's also a question of our consumption behavior and um, uh, what prices we are asking for, uh, for soy and other products. Thank you. Uh, I want to pull it back a little bit um, to the EU-UK uh, cooperation. Um, and Claire, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on, on the spot again, um, but uh, there were a couple of things which you mentioned, uh, which I think are important in that context. Um, one, uh, you emphasized uh, the innovation aspect. Um, but clearly, when we're talking about innovation, then we are talking about areas which touch on uh, issues such as industrial strategies on both sides, competition policy, we're touching on areas such as strategic autonomy, which was already mentioned. Um, so yes, it is, uh, of course, a positive goal to make progress together on innovation, but that is within the context of also competition of um, uh, a large degree of friction. So when we're looking at, for example, standards, uh, how likely is it that the EU and the UK 
will cooperate on setting standards, which is one of the most important uh, issues in terms of, of uh, also greening uh, our industry. So that, that's one question. Uh, so hey, these are two difficult ones, and uh, I, I would like to hear also from the other panelists. But the other one you mentioned, um, and that was also mentioned um, in Lord Frost's speech yesterday, uh, is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, and I think uh, when we're looking um, forward to the longer term cooperation on climate, this question of uh, what happens uh, when there is divergence, what happens when there are uh, new instruments which are coming online. Um, my reading of the speech uh, yesterday on this particular issue uh, was that it's a bit of a warning shot um, from the UK. Uh, so, uh, but maybe I'm interpreting that wrongly. Um, so very glad um, to hear from you. Thank you. They are difficult questions. I'll do my best. Um, uh, so I might take the second one first, if I may. Um, on carbon border adjustment mechanism, I, mean, I think we have quite a lot of sympathy for why the EU is looking at this issue, like carbon leakage is an issue. And um, there are various ways to address address leakage. Um, the EU has sort of put its cards on the table in respect to CBAM. And, you know, I, I, you know, we can, we can see why it's out there. I think we do have concerns about it, around protectionism that it could create, about sort of com compatibility with WTO, WTO rules. It, it is it, so. I wouldn't necessarily interpret the Frost line about CBAM as a warning shot. I think it is is a reference to something that's going to be difficult and something we are going to need to engage with them on in the future. And in some ways, I think that's quite a positive thing in this context. Like that is a, it is a huge policy, and it is one that. It's going to have quite big challenges getting through the EU's internal processes before it even becomes a sort of policy in, a, in effect. Um, we are, you know, it is something that has been talked about um, between, for example, Timmermans and, and Sharma. It is not something that has completely never, never been mentioned. Um, and I think those, those relationships are re re sort of, uh, enable a relatively open conversation. I think it's very difficult to mention CBAM without mentioning ETS. Um, I think with the ETS, the positive thing we saw in the TCA was that we did mention there that we will explore opportunities for linkage based on our white paper, which made very clear we intend to internationally link. And we're very much a fan of carbon pricing in the UK, as, as is the EU. I think our problem for this, and, and it's relevant to both ETS and CBAM, is the need to find a global sort of fix for this. And if the UK can find a sort of a global uh, solution that is going to be our priority and in the sort of sorry it doesn't necessarily mean the default will be linkage to the EU's ETS absolutely not um, but it, there hasn't been a political decision on this and we'll have to see how how things play out in the coming months and in particular on CBAM and ETS see how it plays out in the EU's internal processes it's, it's clear that the ETS is the most um, challenging and uh, difficult for the EU to get through, given the different sort of extensions that's, that's involved in that, and especially in the context of the wider energy prices that we're seeing at the moment. So we'll be watching both and how they both progress with real interest. And I should also say that some sort of more, um, some discussions are already ongoing with the EU about sort of what linking on the ETS might look like, not with a political view behind it, but just to enable those conversations so a better place to be able to advise in, in due course. On your first question on innovation, um, yes, absolutely. Innovation is a positive goal. COP26 enables us to absolutely showcase the importance of innovation and the importance of working together across borders to deliver innovation that, as I say, just has to happen to deliver climate, genuine climate change. Um, there are wider challenges, you know, one of the benefits or one of the rationales for Brexit was to enable more sovereignty, more control over the sort of UK rules, and that will naturally mean a degree of more competition between the UK and EU market. At the same time, there are very important rules in the TCA around non-regression and not, not regressing on standards, including on climate policy. Um, so there, there will always be a degree of friction, just as there is with all countries and sort of other third countries in terms of competition that can, can result. How likely is it that the UK and EU will cooperate on setting standards? 
it depends on the areas as as we've seen there are some areas like we do absolutely want to be cooperating on on the sort of health side look we're part of the eu's health security committee because the importance of covid in other areas um such as horizon which i mentioned earlier in my opening remarks we want to be working together on on sort of the need to drive sort of research and development in this space forward on standards more generally you know as i say the uk's one of the rationales was about maintaining sovereignty and, and that relates to regulation as well but that doesn't mean you can't develop regulation in, in conversation and sort of learn lessons from others as well so i suppose that's probably all i can say or we'll just have to see us of course as well about how the politics goes goes through the system but ultimately the, the uk isn't is very unlikely to sort of cede regulatory autonomy that it has gained uh, with it with a you know uh, through the sort of process, but of course that's in the context of non regression standards which it's set out in the TCA. Thanks very much. Um, if, if someone else wants to come in, please do. Um, but I also wanted to pick up something uh, which was already uh, mentioned in passing, but also which is reflected in a couple of questions which is the role uh, of the wider ecosystem, so beyond government. Um, uh, there's a reference to towns, cities, and regions. Uh, there's a reference uh, also to business. Um, so uh, it would be good to also hear uh, the view from the panel and how far uh, there are opportunities for EU-UK climate cooperation uh, beyond the formalized uh, government channels. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it's really important that we look at the wider systems, and you know, I think this also speaks in, in in the chat to you know the very difficult politics we're having over the Irish Protocol and and where that sits. You know, the, you know, we have to sort of try and I feel to sustain cooperation on both sides, build as many productive links as we can between the EU and the UK, and at the moment that is very difficult at the heads of state level as we look at the at the, at the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, but there are many other places where I think we can make progress, and it will be about the depth and the strength of those links that we're able to forge in those other areas. I think will you know hopefully over time be able to make uh, you know make make a big difference in the overall level of cooperation. So I think particularly when we look at cities initiatives, um, you know, and that's one of the things that's again we will pick up at COP26 and have a focus on that and having mayors come together and build those links and relationships. I think that's really important. Um, I think it's really important. Obviously, there are many businesses that operate on both sides of the channel and therefore are trying to you know, navigate the, the new normal of, uh, of Brexit and therefore be able to build those links and cooperation, I think is key. Um, we've talked, you know, and Andreas talked about, um, you know, obviously initiatives in the private finance centre. So initiatives be able to link between the UK City of London and you know the center the finance centers in in germany in france uh in in italy um you know and other parts of the eu i think there's a lot we can do there and it comes back to this question of can we create a race to the top on standards rather than a race to the bottom so what is what are the conditions that actually lead to this this healthy competition rather than a destructive competition uh, and, and and a race there and i think you know this comes back to the innovation question and 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 sort of questions on, on standards there and so for me in the uk there are some really big choices we're coming up to at the moment and it's it's critical that we get them right so what happens to the precautionary principle in the uk uh in light of the environment bill which is still going through parliament is really critical yeah there's a lot of uh, arguments being made in the uk at the moment of pivoting to a us scientific risk-based system uh rather than taking a continued precautionary approach and i think if the uk goes down that path it's much more likely that we will see a race to the bottom rather than a race to the top in a number of environment and climate areas. And so actually being able to enshrine the precautionary principle within the environment bill, make sure that it's not weakened is really key. This also speaks to governance. Again, the Office of Environmental Protection, will it have the right powers and independence of government to actually be able to hold the UK government to account? So these things are still very live issues and are still to play for, uh, but I think it, you know what we get out of this will, will be a really key signal. But if we can build, you know, those that connective tissue at other areas so it's not relying on the top state to state interactions i think that will be a pathway to hopefully keeping open a space for a more productive relationship in the future uh, 
Andreas, please. Well, let me, yeah, very, very much agree. A, a very small uh, addition that I would like to, to make perhaps here, not that it's super formalized, but uh, you mentioned that, or we mentioned that uh, at the sub-national level, you, there is already links and there could be more potential for kind of city initiatives on best practices, on sharing how to, uh, between mayors of how to uh, update their infrastructure in the city or, or their, uh, their, their utilities network. And so one thing that I think would be also a very interesting um, unit of analysis, so to speak, now with the whole just transition mechanism on the EU level, we have the territorial just transition plans to really look also perhaps in, in linking regions that are in a transition, which have a variety of stakeholders, and not only the municipal governments, but also the local businesses, their supply chains, uh, civil society actors, and those kind of things. Uh, I think this could be also an interesting uh, focus area, um, as I, I guess you also have uh, similar uh, re regional transitions in the UK, and if there could be something being happening between, or is already happening between UK and EU regions on, on transition plans and those kind of things. Thanks very much. Um... Uh, one thing I, I wanted to challenge a bit, um, which I heard in some of the comments, um, which was what happens post uh, COP26. Um, and for me, um, there was some optimism in terms of um, how we can develop going forward. Um, I would take a very different view. Um, I think COP26, actually is the only thing which is forcing us at the moment uh, to continue that cooperation. Uh, and once that pressure is not there, I think we will see a further deterioration in line with uh, the overall relationship, uh, which is not going well. Um, so I'm wondering in how far there will be a positive uh, um, post-COP um, cooperation. Um, but maybe I'm being too pessimistic. So if someone wants to come in and uh, be more optimistic, then please do so. I, th I think I already said I was an optimist. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think that'd be an I mean, I, I think I agree with your assessment. I think it, there would be a question of time scale. So for me, I think there's probably enough this year to sort of carry on for another 12 months but I think you do run out of road after that and so you know they, I think we can we can sort of argue about the time scales but I think it is that thing of you have to have a reason to cooperate so the German G7 I think will provide in the handover between the UK and and Germany you know does provide a platform to carry a number of these things forward you know as Claire said obviously the UK is actually the presidency for the full 12 months after after COP26 so there will be a continuing UK presidency role working closely with the the incoming Egypt presidency and again I think that will provide a focal point for cooperation but by 2023 yeah, I think I, I completely agree with you. I think that, that you do run out of road if you aren't able to build those other pieces of cooperation. And that's where I would come back to things in the TCA, you know, which talked about like linking carbon pricing mechanisms like energy interconnection and, and shared energy security. If we get those sort of really substantial things right, I feel that provides a much better basis for cooperation than just, you know, and that, and that would help sustain and play into the, into the international dimension. So. I think we might be disagreeing more on timescales rather than rather than rather than rationale on that. Um, someone else want to come in on this? Or? I can I can just very quickly agree with, with Bruce Shane. I, I, I think we absolutely will see a reduction in engagement because the summit is the, the driving factor. But I think the presidency gives us an, an ability to adjust. So we're adjusting to a new normal rather than a sort of a bit of a cliff edge. And that gives us an opportunity to, to make more of what the relationship looks going forward. I'd also highlight that we work with the EU and, and others who we've never been sort of so closely aligned with, such as the US and others, very well in sort of G7, G20, wider multinational, international sort of fora to build consensus, to build like-minded groups. And, and that's always been the case. And 
I don't think that will change going, going forward. Um, so we might be working with the EU differently, but I wouldn't necessarily think there's, there, there are always going to be opportunities that are, that are alive that we can make the most of. It's a matter of sort of how sort of if there's anything new that we need to, to lay on top. Um, and then, as, as Shane says, I agree with all the points in the TCA. Um, so I'll leave it there, but I'm, I'm on the optimistic end of the spectrum. And, and based on sort of initial conversations with the EU, I think the will is there. It is about how we make it happen in, in practice. Thanks very much. Um, oh. Oh yeah, Kira. Yeah, I think um, I think it's it's favorable to to continue to cooperate on the regional and and city level. Um, I think this can strengthen ties for sure. Um, but also there, I mean, these are usually funds that come from national governments, right? So um, it's it's in the end, it's not completely independent from each other. And I think if there's uh, if the tensions uh, continue to to worsen, as I observe it right now, I think it's going to be very very difficult. So I agree with your assessment, Fabian, that um, this is this is problematic. And um, I think maybe as as citizens, scientists, um, whatever you consider yourself outside of the government sector, I think we should also be responsible for urging our leaders to uh, to find solutions and to stop provocations. Very much. Um, I wanted to pick up uh, another point which was mentioned, um, which was uh, climate adaptation. Um, I think we've seen uh, on both in the UK and, and uh, in the EU over the last years um, the effect uh, of uh, some of the uh, extreme weather events uh, linked to climate change. Um, so, is there um, opportunity there to cooperate, both in terms of addressing it domestically, but also uh, looking more at the global picture. I'd like to come in, Shane. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, th I think there is an urgent need. So I'll, I'll start I'll start on the, the global picture and then and then go locally. I mean, obviously, one of the key things um, you know, people are campaigning for this year is to increase the share of uh, climate finance money that's going to adaptation. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we would hope to see at COP26 is not just that we are have a pathway to, to, to meeting the 100 billion, that, but that within the, the 100 billion, there is more money going to adaptation because you know, that's obviously a critical issue that, that developing countries, um, uh, it's important for them to prioritize. I think we've also obviously seen you know, a long history of cooperation between the UK and EU, including sort of you know, shared missions in, in some uh, countries in, you know, in Africa and elsewhere, um, in terms of actually delivering development and aid support on the ground and sort of how we can join up and continue to coordinate programmes, because it does require a whole of a whole of country approach in order to get adaptation right. It's not something you can just bolt onto the side of your of your traditional development models. Um, and so I think there is a real, you know, potential there in order for us to, to, to go forward. Obviously, the backdrop of this is the UK cutting its overseas development assistance budget, and that that makes things really tough. Uh, and certainly groups such as ours and, and others in the UK are arguing for that to be swiftly reversed. Uh, and hopefully there may be a pathway uh, that we can we can work on that. So there are some real challenges uh, in order to do that. Um, but I think there is an urgent need. And I think in terms of the global politics, both at COP26 and for COP27, adaptation is going to be key. You know, the Egypt COP is going to be a COP that will focus on adaptation and, and loss and damage. And so being able to make progress internationally there, I think is, is key. So I don't think we have the answers, but I think we have an urgent and pressing need to work together to try and find the solutions over the next 12 months uh, in order to do that. In terms of what's happening domestically, obviously there are some really critical shared risks, and I think you know it's important that both 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 sides you know invest um, to in order to, to meet to meet adaptation challenges. Obviously, the UK has its uh, spending review coming up uh, later this month, and this will be a key thing both on mitigation and adaptation. Are we going to walk the talk and actually put the UK government investment uh, where it's needed in order to get on track both for net zero and adaptation? Uh, so that's the twenty seventh of October, and so just 
just just going into the cop and so stakes are quite high there but a lot of the mood music and message coming from uk treasury at the moment is quite climate skeptic so i'm not hugely uh you know optimistic there but again this comes back to the lesson learning i think what is really key is being able to understand how we can adapt and how we can share and create markets so one of the obvious areas is on um buildings heat and uh, and cooling efficiency and you know it's not the sexiest topic but it makes a huge difference in terms of tons of carbon and it's one of the most different difficult areas um when we think about the decarbonization pathway over the next 10 years and i think the uk and eu working together on that is something where i think we could make real progress and would potentially make a make a real difference and it crowds in a lot of investment from the private sector Thank you much. Uh, Kira? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, potentials for joint uh, initiatives when it comes to domestic adaptation. Um, so I think especially coastal protection is a, is a key issue that should be confronted together and where mutual learning is, is really called for. Um, and I think this is, this is crucial. Um, I also have yeah concerns regarding uh, the changes in UK uh, development cooperation. So I think this this will be definitely a challenge to see how how this will play out and how we can, um, yeah, uh, build uh, cooperation on a constrained budget uh, with rising challenges uh, globally and rising inequalities um, within countries. So I think. Um, this is um, an issue of concern, and I, I agree there are challenges, but um, I also agree with Shane that basically uh, we don't have any other choice than to uh, really step up um, our, our efforts in adaptation, because we're already witnessing the displacement of people, um, large-scale displacement, internal displacement of people because of climate change impacts um, all over the globe so i think um, we will see a lot more of this um, and therefore we have to provide people with options to um, to remain um, to adapt in place uh, to protect their natural environment to protect their livelihoods i think these are the crucial challenges of maybe of the century and i think um, we cannot shy away from it as some of the richest nations in the world to cooperate on this Thanks very much. Uh, we're getting close to the end, and I know, uh, Kira, you have to leave uh, in a minute. So I'll, I'll just gonna ask uh, all of the panelists um, for just one minute, um, either what should or what can be achieved in EU UK climate cooperation in the short and in the long term. So I'm giving you the the choice of being optimistic or uh, realistic. Um, so I'll start with Kira, given that you will have to go. Yeah, I want to remain optimistic because uh, the UK is an important partner for the EU and it's quite obvious that the EU would have liked the UK to remain, so it would be uh, stupid to say to stop cooperation uh, if the outset was that we were uh, in this together um, from the very beginning, so I think there's still a great sadness uh, of uh, people in the EU that the UK has left. Um, and I think, um, yeah, the question is what will both partners put on the table uh, to, to continue cooperation? And uh, what is the genuine interest in cooperation? I think it, this is also, has to be shown also by the leaders so that, um, I mean, leaders are there to, to lead the country, right? So, and the question is, um, will so to say subnational corporation substitute some of the um, uh, broken ties uh, i think it's possible um, if there is um, genuine interest in cooperation so uh, i would be carefully also optimistic um, because of the pressure um, of the problems so i think in a changing climate we will be forced to cooperate uh, because we are in this together as humanity and therefore um, have to confront these changes and combat these changes jointly. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I'll just go in the reverse order, um, so Claire. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think it should and can be achieved. Um, it's not going to happen as naturally um, as we've seen in the last year. It's going to need much more active 
consideration and will on on both sides um currently despite wider politics i think the will is there we need to work quite hard to keep that um i think there's something about also demonstrating publicly what we are doing with our eu counterparts going forward to sort of have some positive spillovers for civil society and wider and hopefully a degree of reassurance um, so people can see it as, as a real thing happening um, implementation absolutely key um, we need to both sides demonstrate that these targets are achievable and lead by example in implementing them um, otherwise it's, it's pretty hard to to expect others to do so and final point i think a degree of competition between the uk and the eu as long as it's healthy competition is, is no bad thing to drive to drive ambition and to drive us both forward and that doesn't necessarily need us to be talking every day but heading in the same direction and i think we're seeing that at the moment and we need to make sure sort of that that overall heading in the right direction continues thanks andreas yeah thank you um so also i think my outlook is there is in the long term there is a, a good outlook for for cooperation because just the the costs of inaction are so prohibitive or, or, or enormous that just from a, a, a thinking about perspective we should be be working together and um on those issues now the thing is that i think what are the necessary conditions is a little bit that there is trust that this is really that there is a plan that think things are credible that people are accountable also on the leaders level and on a national level so that other um parts of society uh, then can basically have this planning security. And there, I think, where does this trust come from? From really implementation, from having coherent short-term plan rather than just grandiose statements. And, and I think this is the hard work then. And if you can really see that there is something happening in terms of really uh, with emissions reductions that we can see uh, and commitments that we live up to and not just kind of making up nice numbers and, and targets that are uh, decades away, then I think we, we can get things really going on in multiple issues, including uh, transport, finance, energy, and so on. Thank you, and Frank. Uh, thank you. I guess I'm reminded of, of the morning when Donald Trump was elected uh, back in 2016, talking to, to one of my American colleagues on the way to, to a COP uh, back in 2016. And he said, you know, the most important thing is now we all have to do our jobs. You know, this is going to be take us to a dark space. But the important thing is if we do our jobs, we can come out the other side. And although it's by no means over, you know, the US is in a very different place four years on than it is now. I think Brexit is in a similarly dark place at the moment when we look at the, the broader politics. Therefore, it is really important that we all do our jobs because there is the potential for cooperation. And we know that that is, you know, the win-wins come from that. Um, and I think, you know, climate has been one of the bright points so far of Brexit. So we need to nurture, cherish and build on that in order to make it happen. But the important thing is to do our jobs. And I think forums like this and many others are needed to keep that flame alive um, as we go through the dark days of, of, of the coming weeks and months. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to just pick up very briefly. Um, there, were, there was uh, a question from Mark Johnston uh, about how long will the standoff over Ireland last? Um, and I would just wanted to say that uh, I think the difficulty we have is uh, when we look at the overall relationship, uh, at least from my perspective, it doesn't look like uh, we are uh, reaching a resolution uh, anytime soon uh, on, on some of these issues with even the potential of uh, an escalation uh, in uh, the friction which is there. So obviously, um, as we've also heard today, that will influence uh, climate cooperation as well. Um, I think, yes, it is important to try to isolate it as much as possible, but because it also touches so many other areas. Um, as we've discussed today, um, from trade to industrial policy, to innovation, uh, to CBAM, um, to all of the different issues we, we have talked about. Um, I think it will be a tricky period. Um, and if we really do see an escalation, uh, which could lead to a breakdown of the TCA, uh, then it will become even more tricky. Um, but we should always bear in mind uh, that this is an issue where the world cannot afford not to cooperate. Um, it is a, an existential uh, challenge 
uh, which will have to be addressed. Um, so hopefully we will see progress uh, at uh, COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and hopefully we will continue to see progress in addressing these also in the cooperation uh, between uh, the UK and the EU. Um, so I'm sure we will return to this. Uh, the topic is very important. Uh, there were also um, a few questions uh, in uh, the chat which were more aimed at the broader picture uh, of what we can achieve at COP26, what kind of changes we need to have in economics. Um, I didn't pick them up this time because we wanted to focus on EU-UK cooperation, uh, but please be assured that uh, we certainly uh, at the EPC will continue to have these debates also uh, on those broader issues. Um, but just it remains for me just to thank uh, the participants um, and the audience uh, for taking part today. I think it was a good discussion, an important discussion. Maybe I'm not uh, the most optimistic person, um, but I think it uh, certainly emphasized the need um, for continued cooperation. And I also wanted to thank again the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, for supporting uh, this uh, debate. So thank you all very much, and I hope to see you again very soon. <laughs>